Kia ora koutou and welcome to Ōtotahi City Voices, where we listen to Ōtotahi during the COVID-19 pandemic by interviewing city makers and community leaders. We're interested in hearing from a diversity of voices about what Christchurch discovered when we were under lockdown and how it influenced or galvanised their vision for Ōtotahi Christchurch. I'm Jessica Halliday and I'm the director of Te Pūtahi, Centre for Architecture and City Making. And today I'm talking with Ryan Reynolds, the director and co-founder of Gap Villa. Kia ora, Ryan. Kia ora, Dr. Halliday. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. Um, <laughs> hey, welcome and thank you for being part of Ōtotahi City Places. It's good to have you here. It'd be great if you could start us off by telling a bit about us a bit about who you are, what you do, and what your passion is. Oh dear, okay, get right into it. Um, yep, my name's Ryan. Uh, as you said, I'm the director at the moment of Gap Filler. Uh, we're a small practice here in Christchurch. There's six of us on the team, about four full-time equivalent. Um, and I think given the size, we do a pretty wide range of things that all relate broadly to um, bringing better community outcomes in city making. Often it goes under the name of placemaking. And um, so we probably are most known within Christchurch for designing and delivering kind of fun, creative civic installations like the dance mat and the Super Street Arcade and sort of innovative playground-y type equipment and stuff like that. And um, we also do a lot of work in other cities and increasingly we're doing a lot of work on um, larger scale residential developments, civic developments, where we work alongside a team of planners and landscape architects and often kind of lead the community engagement side of thing and try to translate the community aspirations into the design. Cool. And yeah. would you say your work with Gapfiller is your passion? Yeah. I think I have to say that because I'm constantly confronted with the fact that I have no real hobbies. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. So what part of uh, the city were you in during lockdown? Littleton. Cool. Right on top of the tunnel. Yeah. So what did you discover or learn about our city or about your community during lockdown? Yeah, I was uh, having a lot more time in Littleton was great for me because so much of Gap Filler's work and my work is focused on the central city. Um, so I often feel like I live in Littleton, but I'm not really active in that community or present there. So that was nice just to be able to go on lots of walks. It's a great place to be stuck with all the, the hills and the walks around there and proximity to the bays and everything. Um, I think I... I really appreciated lots of the small creative gestures people were making, the, the teddy bear hunts and, and little sidewalk art and things like that. And it did, um, in other ways as well, but it did remind me a bit of that um, immediate post-quake period a decade ago where people started creating and producing a lot more and consuming a lot less for a while. Um, so that was certainly one, one yeah, notable aspect. I guess the other was how much, um, how quiet the streets were and how people started walking right down the middle of the roads, even the main street, London Street in Littleton, and people would walk right down the, the middle of the road because there were so few cars and it was wonderful. And so I, um, our kids got, there's, you know, there aren't many flat spaces in Littleton and our kids got to practice biking and scootering right down the middle of the road in a way that they never have before, just because that um, pedestrians owned it. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, I mean, you're right. It's interesting thinking that we all had this very um, direct and actually quite prolonged experience of what it's like to have streets that are primarily for people cycling and walking. Um, yeah. in a way that none of us have ever had before. Yeah, that was interesting. Yeah. So what... It's interesting. I, I guess what struck me out of that is how much it's in an attitude or a convention as well. Um, it, it, like, of course it has to do with the traffic volume on the street, but as more cars were coming back, I was like, this is interesting, because if we as pedestrians maintained that same attitude that actually 
the road's mostly for us and when cars come along they'll slow down and we'll sort of get out of the way whatever that london street still could function that way uh but it doesn't it, it hasn't but i thought about you know when i'd been in Kathmandu and the roads are really narrow and there's so much pedestrian bicycle vehicle traffic and everyone's just right in the middle of the road and cars come along and go beep 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 and people sort of shuffle over and um but there's that sense that the road belongs to everyone. Everyone's got a right, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's interesting. Mm. So yeah. did anything about lockdown really surprise you? Uh, well, yeah, I, I actually, I, I think I fell victim to a trap <laughs> that, that some of us did. With, and I really don't remember where it came from, but this idea, um, heading into lockdown or in the first couple of days that it was going to be a time to catch up on everything that I was going to catch up on work around the house and read all the classic novels that I never got around to and spend more time with the family and keep up with work and whatever and I, I, can, I, I bought it I kind of had all of these high expectations um, and then the reality was really quite the opposite for us. We had two small kids at home all the time, both of us trying to work, and well, not not many, yeah, not much literature got, got read. Um, so, I, I, but I guess that was it. How you know, this is uh, of everything in my lifetime. This is the the event that has been most widely experienced by everyone. Quite different to the earthquake, say that was you know a very localized thing. Um, and yet within that people's experiences were so drastically different. Mm. Yeah. So, um, thinking about that, what are your post lockdown fears or what are you most worried about coming out of it? And we're now at level one. Um, yeah. Uh, my biggest fear which I, it, it still, I think still could go either way, but actually my biggest fear is that we just go back to the pre-COVID normal and not learn anything from this experience. Do you think that's way. happening now? I mean, we've been at level one for a week now on the data, this is our conversation. Do you think it is just back to business as usual? It depends at what level you look at it on. It, it, it's, uh, yeah, there certainly seems to be a very strong element of that. Business as usual, the, the, the pressure for that is really immense. Hey, even, you know, when talking, when level three was just a whisper that people were starting to talk about, we were already, um, you know, getting sold the idea that having a burger or, or, you know, getting some takeaways or whatever was going to just be this amazing thing. And, and you know, maybe it, maybe it is, maybe it was. But, um, yeah, that coercion to go back to shopping, buying, consuming, have the number one narrative has been support business, spend a bit more money. That's been the number one message I've been getting since lockdown. And I, I don't kind of disagree with it on one level, but it is just such a strong pushback towards business as usual, or even beyond business as usual. Yesterday's announcement that the government's fast tracking a bunch of big infrastructure projects, so there's no RMA. You know, there will be some sort of fast tracked um, process about job creation and job retention. That's the the, the justification for it, but um, you know, the RMA is there for a reason, and likewise, the the sort of um, fast tracking or extra funding for shovel ready projects. Uh, I worry that this thing that I'm spent so much time cultivating around how to translate community voices into development processes is just going to get left behind completely because in a fast track process, you still keep the engineering, you still keep the designers, you still keep the construction firms, but everything else around the edges is considered non-essential. So um, yeah, I think that's a there is a real risk there and then on the other hand we see um maybe it's not fair to put it in the same basket but the black lives matter protests going around the world and there's a really strong sense as well that things aren't normal and things aren't just going to go back to normal and people who are trying to use the COVID experience to say look we can reduce carbon emissions we we 
we did it when we were forced to, now we have to make ways of doing it sort of a bit more voluntarily. Um, so I don't know, it still could go either way, but I think the normative forces are a lot stronger than the um, forces of change. Yeah, and it, I, I think it's interesting, indeed, watching the strong push towards change in other parts of the world. But in New Zealand, where we have bought ourselves the significant freedom that we now have from, mm. from as the Prime Minister says, going hard and going early, it's, we can just kind of step back into business as usual. That's what that freedom has given us, is, is accepting things like tourism and anything associated with that particular sector. And, you know, acknowledging that lots of people are losing jobs and that's a significant change. But, mm -hmm. you know, we are at risk of losing that push or that desire for change because it's so easy for us to step back into life. Yeah. I think the hardest balance, because there is that coercive pressure and businesses going under and everything, is to take a very, very short-term view of let's just you know, create as much domestic tourism, as much economic activity or whatever as we can, which is around kind of job and business retention. But let's also be making the medium long-term plans, which there are some conversations around, you know, hey, the tourism industry was already broken. It was bringing way more people into certain parts of this country than they can sustain. So let's stop and, and have a little rethink about how our tourism industry functions overall um but how can you do both of those things at once kind of retain push for the re return to the status quo while in a one to three or beyond year view you're pushing for pretty rapid change that's a hard hard balance yeah indeed and it, and of course the idea that it brings to mind is the idea of a just transition like we are in a space in which we could actually trial what that means because you know we have so many people out of work and we have so many um businesses struggling that mm. you're right this could be a moment at which we go what does a just transition look like mm. Mm. so what does this experience lead you to hope or dream for Otatahi Christchurch you've always you've been working in this area for a long time um thinking about a vision for the city or working with people who have a vision for the city, has it changed or is it the same? Is, are you, do you feel galvanized? What is your dream? Hmm. I, 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 I don't feel like it's changed much. It's just, uh, I feel like we have the, the, you know, everyone uses disasters as an opportunity to kind of pick up or push some agendas. And I feel like we had a real opportunity with the earthquakes and for the most part we squandered it or it was squandered for us <laughs> in a way by certain agencies and, and so on. But anyway, we, we kind of failed to capitalize on an opportunity there. And I was feeling uh, that, that we just missed the boat in a way. And I feel like now, oh, maybe we've got that opportunity again, actually. And so here's a, here's, you know, here's a chance to put in practice some of the things we failed to a decade ago or over the last decade. Um, and what, are, what, what have we failed at that we could do, um, rectify? Well, I mean, broadly speaking, we, I, I think, I mean, we haven't built a, a city for, by, and about people, really. The, um, the central government's approach to the quake recovery was get as many regulations out of the way as possible so that anyone who has some money they want to spend and develop something in the city more or less can do it. That's obviously a real oversimplification, but um, that, that's the kind of general philosophy that was followed through on, I think. And yeah, if we're talking about some of the big issues that have been not really brought to light, but um, emphasized again by the COVID experience. So I, I think we need regulations, we need incentives in place, and we could be building, you know, 
a, a city that's really seriously thinking about what a carbon zero future looks like. And we could start that right now. And actually we've got more opportunity here than loads of other cities because so much of the city is still yet to be redeveloped. Um, so yeah, I think, think, yeah. And um, a, a city built by forum with people, that's something that Gatville has always worked. That's an area or a goal or a dream Gatville has always worked towards or contributed to. Has that work changed as a result of COVID? Uh, I don't, no, no, I don't think so. I think it was harder for a while to get an understanding of where people are at, what they're thinking, what they're feeling when we were in lockdown and we were kind of desperate to try to do a lot of video interviews and just check in with people because we were all so much in our little bubbles, hard to know. Um, you know, normally we really rely on having feet on the ground as it were to get a sense of how people are feeling and what's, what's in the air. Um, so, I don't think that's changed. I do see, you know, um, in the really short term, I feel like gap fillers, general aims and the aims of small local businesses have overlapped more than normal. Like if all the businesses in the central city collapse, all the cafes and everything, well, it's not going to be the sort of city that we want either. So there is some, you know, um, it's a, yeah, a little bit complicated um, in that respect. Uh, where you draw the line between community and and business. And, well, I mean, so. this is the interesting thing is we've cr constructed a framework where we see them as separate, but actually business yeah. is, is part of the community. And often, uh, especially a lot of those small cafes, that, you know, and other small businesses, those are owned and operated and they employ all people who are part of the community. So it's an artificial separation to begin with. So that's certainly been one strand of our conversations has been interrogating a bit more this idea of shop local. I think that's somewhere where um, it could benefit from a, a lot more nuance. This idea of like, is shopping at Westfield or H&M local? Well, yes. And if you're Christchurch NZ and you have to support the economic activity of the region, you don't kind of differentiate. Just go shop local, everyone. And sure, H&M employs some people, but you know, the money doesn't stay local. And so they actually have um, really interesting data now on kind of the local multiplier effect, industry by industry, sector by sector, and how much money stays local. Um, so for instance, in uh, hospitality, much, much higher percentage of the money stays local and has that kind of local multiplier effect because there are so many small locally owned hospitality things. Retail has a much lower percentage and other industries much lower again, which is just something I'd never really um, thought about. But that idea of not only interrogating that who, who owns it, where does the money go, but also looking at everyone's supply chains in a way. I thought in that idea of shop local and, you know, Maybe it's really overstepping, but an agency like Christchurch NZ could throw $500 to every hospitality outlet in the city and say, uh, look through your menu and, and see what local wines, beverage suppliers, whatever, just have a menu review. And here's a few conditions. We'll give you $500 or whatever to kind of review your menu and add a bit more local in your supply chain. That could have a way bigger impact than whatever kind of marketing campaign, I think. Anyway. Yeah, no, interesting thought. Hey, thank you, Ryan. It's been great to chat with you today. Um, so how do people find you or Gapfiller online? Website's the easiest way, getfiller.org.nz. And from there, you can find all of our social media channels. Yep. Cool. So it's been a pleasure talking with you today. And thanks to those of you who are watching or listening. Please send us in your feedback, share your views or vision for Ōtutahi now. We'd love to hear from you. So it's goodbye from Ryan. Goodbye. <laughs> and it's goodbye from me, Kakiti Anō.